see for you. <laughs> it's very Well, good morning, everyone. Good, morning. good to see everybody today. It's starting to heat up again. It's good to be in this lovely space where it's cool. 
and quiet. Thank you for that beautiful prelude, John. And thank you again for covering for Betty while she's on vacation. She'll be back again next week. It is a day to think about who Jesus is to us. Today we focus on the story from Matthew's Gospel uh, of Jesus walking on the water. I don't know if any of you have ever tried that. I have. Didn't work. (laughs) Not even with the skis. That's exactly what I was thinking. (laughs) Exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. So we'll say more about that a little bit later in the service. But I also want to mention, before we get to the offering time later today, that um, some, many of you, I'm sure, are concerned about what's going on with the wildfires in Hawaii. And um, you can always make write checks to support that that can be forwarded through the church to uh, Lutheran Disaster Response or any number of the responding agencies. If you would like to take a piece of paper that has the address of where to send a check and what the name is for Lutheran Disaster Response, which is on the ground there, working closely with Pacifica Synod to attend to the needs of the churches and the church communities in particular um, on both islands that are affected thus far. Uh, There's a small piece of paper on the little um, Uh, stand on the way out the door, or you can grab one at some point in the service if you like. Let's take a moment and just realize that the presence of God is here with us. Take a deep breath. Let go of any anxiety or worries that you might have brought in with you this morning. At least set them aside temporarily. You might even imagine in your mind setting them on the altar and letting God take care of them in this hour. We'll take a moment of silence and then we'll begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please stand as we sing our praises to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. And of course, you have instruments in your pew rack, so please feel free to grab them.
oh God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. The first lesson today is from 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all of the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Word of life, word of God, word of life. The psalm will be read responsively. Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. For you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The Lord will indeed indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God's pathway. Our second lesson is from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. 
But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Word of God, word of life. reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowds. And this is the same crowds from last week that they had just fed. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. So you remember the story from last week. Jesus had postponed taking time in solitude after the death of his cousin John. But in today's story, we see that he didn't forget or even forego that time. He was, after all, still grieving, even after he had stopped to teach and feed the massive crowds that had followed him on his journey. And in today's lesson, we see that it begins with Jesus taking that time to be quiet, to pray, 
to recenter after a traumatic experience. So as a bit of an aside, I want to say I want to underscore that sometimes overlooked piece of this story and hope that it stands as a reminder to all of us how important it is to take time to grieve, to reflect, to recharge our psyches after a traumatic event or a loss or even news of disasters that don't directly affect us. The fires in Hawaii and the lives affected warrant us pausing to pray, to consider God's hand at work in the remedy efforts that are going on there. The war in Ukraine and the lives affected warrant us to take time every day, even if it's just a moment to claim God's power and presence in every town and village where lives are being lost and traumatized. Grieving doesn't have to be hours and hours of crying, but pushing it away will undermine our ability to find strength and peace in each and every day that we have. It can be as simple as just taking a moment to breathe in the presence of God and to breathe out the horror of the story or of the news that we've gotten. A moment to breathe in and remember the promises of God and a moment to breathe out the fear and the hopelessness that sometimes whispers in our ear that nothing will ever change. Jesus needed to take that time, and we mere mortals will do well to follow his lead on that. Okay, back to the rest of the story. After taking that time, Jesus once again finds himself responding to the needs of others. The disciples have been out on the boat, giving Jesus some space and the winds start to come up in a terrifying way. I don't have any way of knowing for sure, but I'm thinking it's a solid guess that in Jesus' day, and certainly the disciples in this story, probably had not had swim lessons at the YMCA or the local park and rec routine in their summer before their sixth grade year or something, right? In fact, I doubt that any of them had any idea that one could be in the water and survive well, even without a storm, right? These are the kinds of things that you have to peel back when you read the scriptures because we assume most people know how to swim, right? Not a thing in Jesus' day. It's a very modern notion. And so I imagine that the disciples were quite terrified in their predicament even before they saw Jesus walking toward them on the water. So by the time he did do that and they cry out in fear, they are no doubt petrified. And Jesus tries to comfort them. Remember a time when you were petrified? Now think immediately that the first thing Jesus is going to say to you is, don't worry, it's me. I'm here with you. Something to hold on to for the future, for any and every moment when we find ourselves gripped with fear for one reason or another. The first response of Jesus is, don't worry, I'm here, I've got you. Now the story might have ended there, But Peter, well, Peter's Peter. And he's not entirely convinced, big surprise, right? So Peter throws himself into the moment and says, Lord, if it really is you, command me to come to you to do the exact same thing you're doing, to walk on the water. And the more I thought about that moment, the more I thought one could really argue whether he was testing to see if this really is the Jesus he knows, or he could be testing himself 
as to whether or not he trusts the Jesus he thinks he knows. In either case, Jesus says, come on. And so Peter gets out of the boat and starts to walk on the water toward Jesus. Now I want you to just kind of bracket that in your mind and think about all the times that you have perhaps felt inadequate to whatever task you have felt called to. And imagine Jesus calling you out to do the same level of power and presence of God that he has. It may only last for a minute, right? But it is part of the rhythm of following Jesus, of him inviting us to do as he has done. And so for us to have the courage to step out on the water is an image that we can use to think about how our discipleship works. When we have something that God has called us to that we might think is just a little too big. So Peter gets out of the boat and he walks towards Jesus. Now for a moment, think, set aside Peter and Jesus and remember all of the rest of the disciples in the boat and their experience right now. They have now seen Jesus walk across the water, and Peter, who they know is for sure not Jesus, walk on the water. What a powerful witness. I wonder if they were more afraid of what they were watching than they were of the wind, because they had no way of knowing what is happening here? No context in their life for making any sense out of what Jesus is doing. And then in the midst of it all, because we're all human, Peter has a moment of self-consciousness. Oh, shoot. Here I am. And can't you just imagine that voice in his head that we all probably have a little bit of? That really critical voice that says, Oh, come on, Peter, you're no Jesus. You know, what makes you think you can do this? And the next thing you know, he begins to sink. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And what's the first thing Jesus does? Grabs him. No lecture. No, well, who did you think you were? <laughs> or that was a bold request. Just grabs him again. Think about who God is to you. When you're in that moment that feels like you're sinking, do you sometimes imagine that Jesus is sitting back going, well, I told you so. <laughs> or do you think of Jesus as the one who immediately grabs your hand and keeps you from sinking? And then we have another one of Matthew's little quips, a saying that comes throughout the Gospel of Matthew over and over again. You of little faith, why did you doubt? The tone of that is so critical in how we hear this phrase. And so many times in the Gospels, when we hear Jesus speak, we want to stop and rethink, check our own tone of voice in our own heads to see how we are assuming that Jesus sounds. We could hear that phrase, you of little faith, why did you doubt? As Jesus chastising Peter and disappointed in Peter. Or we could hear it like a father who's smiling at his daughter as she's learning to ride her bike without the training wheels. Oh, honey. Why did you stop pedaling? Encouraging, endearing. And there are probably a dozen or more different ways that we could imagine the tone, imagine the tone of that exchange. So something to keep in mind as you're reading your Bible is anytime Jesus speaks, try and listen to it in a couple of different tones and see which feels like it has the wisdom of the Spirit in it. So all of this happens, and the winds begin to calm as they get back into the boat. And then, very much counterintuitive to what we assume after two phenomenal events have just happened, a 
According to the way Matthew is writing this story, the most powerful of the miracles happens next. And that's when everyone in the boat is overcome with awe and they worship Jesus. That is, they let it be known that their hearts are completely convinced that this Jesus is the Son of God that he is the Messiah. They have nothing held back. They are completely throwing their hearts, their lives, their minds, everything that they are into this acknowledgement. Because what they have seen and experienced completely transforms them, compels them, convicts them. Matthew is the only gospel writer that tells this story about Peter and the walking on the water out of all of the gospels. And I want to just set the context a little bit that Matthew is writing at a time that is at the very cutting edge of the changes that are happening in the society and in the religious world that begin to take shape within the Hebrew community that will eventually, over time, develop into there being a Christian community. There's no Christian community right now. There's just Jesus and all of his Jewish friends. And the Jewish community is wrestling with this Jesus who keeps commanding these thousands of people. Remember, 5,000 not counting the women and children. So maybe six or 7,000 people showed up on the hillside in a rural community where the cities weren't that big. So the Christian, the he, I mean, the Hebrew community is wrestling with this Jesus is commanding more and more attention. He's talking about God, and he's not deferring to the religious leaders, the temple leaders. So there's more and more tension as more and more people show up and more and more people claim that he's cured them or healed them. More and more people start talking about the provocative conversations that they've had with him and this new vision of hopefulness that Jesus is describing about what kind of God we have. And Matthew is desperately trying to help the Hebrew community not feel that this tension means that they need to split off. Are you pro-Jesus or are you anti-Jesus? That's the beginning of what's happening. And Matthew's trying to say, no, 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 no. This Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He's the continuation of what we've been doing for thousands of generations. He is the embodiment of the teachings of the Torah, the law, and the prophets. He's trying to show everything in the Torah leads to Jesus and that he is God at work in the world. So in answer to this question, who is this guy that is doing these things, Matthew is trying to say he is the fulfillment of everything we've ever been about, and that there doesn't need to be this tension, this split. So as amazing as walking on the water is for both Peter and Jesus, in this story they actually serve as catalysts for the transformation of the hearts and minds of the rest of the disciples, convicting them for who this Jesus is, that he is the face of God on earth, that he is the spokesperson for God, and that we are called to participate in this changing of hearts and minds to learn to trust in this God's love, beginning with our own lives and then extending to others. So think about what it might have been like to have been sitting on the hillside last week, listening to Jesus. You're hungry and you're wondering about how the night's going to go. The children are going to be traveling on an empty stomach. And there's all these people. And then Jesus somehow manages to make five loaves of bread and two fish feed thousands of people 
including you and your family? What's the first question that comes to mind for you about Jesus? Maybe, who is this guy? How did he do this? Who could possibly do such a thing? Who do you have to be to have done this? And everybody knows only somebody special, but special in what way? The disciples have had the opportunity to watch Jesus time and time again heal the sick and cure various ailments of every kind. They've had a backstage pass, and they've come to know that he's special and that he has the power of God. But when it came to him wanting them to do what he was doing, to find a way to feed the people, they were stunned and they were baffled. Matt Skinner says it's kind of like Jesus took the training wheels off of the disciples' bikes and then told them to drive down the street. They had an inkling of who he was. It was probably a little amorphous. But even when they couldn't imagine embodying his power, even with his blessing, Jesus still sends them. Because some part of them is still figuring out who is this Jesus. Matthew's trying to answer who is this Jesus. The people on the hillside were trying to figure out who is this Jesus. And now all the disciples in the boat, after watching everything that has happened, they get a whole new visceral education in who Jesus is the kind of power that he possesses. When they see his shared power with Peter, even for a moment, they again get this visceral moment of understanding of the undeniable question, who is this Jesus? And in that moment, everything in them knows the answer on top of all the feeding of the people, watching this in the midst of the storm, in 24 hours they have had three of the most astounding experiences, and all of them convince them the answer is you are the Messiah. You are the one we've been waiting for. Now, Now that they have that answer, they're a little bit more ready to let go of the training wheels. Maybe not fully ready, because they're still of little faith. In Matthew's Gospel, being of little faith is not an altogether bad thing. It's a way lot better than no faith. And little faith implies you can grow it. There are so many ways that the whole experience of the disciples in the boat parallels the experience of the church as we grow and learn. We, too, have had experiences that compel our hearts and minds to believe and trust in God. We, too, sometimes feel like, while we believe, that embodying the power and the love of God is challenging. We might still be a little bit nervous if Jesus said, take these two loaves of fish and feed everybody that's in, what's the name of the stadium, the new stadium? (laughs) Sophie, Sophie Stadium, right? We too might feel a little hesitant if Jesus said, come to me standing on the water. We sometimes still feel like we need our training wheels, don't we? Or is that just me? ultimate power in this story isn't about what it takes to transform their lives. It's the transformation of of their hearts and minds. The ability to wholeheartedly say, Jesus, you are the face of God and the hand of God and the love of God and the presence of God, and I'm going to trust. However little our faith might be, whether we need our training wills or not, 
We are people who can keep pedaling and can make a difference in the world, affecting hearts and minds with the power of God's love and imagining the world that God wants for us and finding every possible way to help build that world. Every time we consider a struggle in the world around us, whether it's the fires in Hawaii or the war in Ukraine or gun violence or other tragedies that happen around us, what would it be like for us to automatically hear in the midst of the noise and the fear and the confusion the voice of God saying to us, come, join me? and stepping out into new territory. I invite you to think about this story this week, to imagine Jesus grabbing your hand this week if you so much as start to sink into a bit of anxiety or fear or confusion or depression or disappointment, or maybe you're just so overwhelmed you're not feeling much of anything. Imagine that hand coming and grabbing yours. I invite you to think about all the times that you have seen God at work in your life and in the world, the things that convinced you wholeheartedly that Jesus is the face of God. And can you find a way to tell that story, to share it with someone who might feel lost and who might feel like they're drowning and they're not expecting a hand? As you live into the story this week, I encourage you to let the story feed your little faith or your big faith if you have it and embolden your witness. May all that we do and say this week answer the question, who is this Jesus? of the church. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. God of grace and faith, your faithfulness is never ending, and your righteousness becomes ours 
through Christ Jesus. Send the church to proclaim the gospel, both near and far, in church buildings and on street corners, in person and through digital means. God of all creation, God of sky and sea, the plants, animals, mountains, and plains proclaim your glory. Prosper the work of ecologists as they teach us new ways to care for the environment. Bring relief to areas recovering from national disast natural disasters. God of all creation, save us from our fears. God of peace and justice, you call us to live as your beloved community throughout the world. Instill in local, regional, national, and global political and civic leaders a desire to work for the well-being of all people. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine and Russia. Direct the work of all who endeavor to alleviate human suffering and to address its root causes. God of all creation, God of care and compassion, you bring assurance when we are afraid. Bring calm to any who are anxious or fearful. Bless the work of therapists, nurses, and other health care providers. Comfort all who grieve and soothe any who are sick. We name before you those who are in need of your healing touch. For those in need of healing from cancer and treatment side effects, Patty Reynolds, Owen Baker, Diane Reed Anderson, Joanne Murray, Dave Edson, Jean Christensen, Bo, Duffy Walton, Jacob Kalau, April Bryan. For those in need of healing in body, mind, soul, and or spirit, Cole Lopez, Mary Jean Schaschler, Margot, Brittany Morales, Don Schneider, Stephanie Truex, Jane Christensen, and David Sanchez. God of all creation, take us by the hand and save us from our fears. God of wonder, you accompany us in both joys and sorrows. We pray for children and teachers preparing for a new school year. Make your presence known in our work and play, in lively conversation and in quiet rest. God of all creation. Here, any other con intercessions may be offered. God of new life, you send people to renew both church and society. We give you thanks for their lives and faithful service, especially nursing pioneers like Florence Nightingale and Clara Mass, whom the church remembers today. As examples of your following your call, God of all creation, Into your hands, O God, we commend all whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Dave has got a new camera, and so it remotely looks around. It's very awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. Please be seated. <laughs> Again, I just want to remind you that as we collect today's offerings, that 
Lutheran uh, disaster response is on the ground in Hawaii helping our friends there, our siblings in Christ. And so I encourage you to be as generous as you are able in the support of that um, recovery effort. So we receive today's offering. <laughs> My apologies, I was doing my donation. <laughs> That's okay, we can wait. <laughs> God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen.
people. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to our and grace. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, mighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out the fire of your Spirit, uniting in one body people of every nation and tongue. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending Together we announce, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Amen. All people are called to Christ's table. You are personally invited. Come and eat what is good. Receive the love, grace, and forgiveness of God. Please be seated. The ushers will invite you forward.
Please stand. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing our sending song. be seated for a couple of announcements. <clears throat> Don't forget that next Sunday we'll be starting the first of three Sundays in a row of adult forums related to our RIC status as a congregation. This is something that we prioritized as a congregation and we're going to spend some time sort of getting everybody back up to speed. What does it mean to be an RIC congregation? How has the world changed since that decision was made? And what kind of updates would be helpful to people? Sometimes language around um, modern issues changes so fast it's hard to even stay in the conversation sometimes. So we're going to be doing that for the next three Sundays. Sundays, beginning next Sunday, but we are going to start and do an abbreviated version next Sunday after the care kit ministry. So come and do the care kit ministry, and then we will continue on for a, a brief um, opening session on that topic next Sunday. Also, this week, um, a mom and her daughter showed up at the congregation just in the office one day. Um, and they are part of the United States government's program uh, uh, called United for Ukraine, I believe is the English translation. And uh, it brings Ukrainians over uh, to the U.S. for, this, for two years uh, who are, have been living in bombed areas and not able to survive or lost a home or that kind of thing. Um, that uh, young woman and her 11-year-old daughter um, 
delightful. Spent a good bit of time with them. Really wonderful to meet them and to hear some of their story. Um, they are looking for a room in someone's house or an ADU if you have it. That somebody that might be able to open up space for them. Hopefully not for a very extended period of time, but. Um, She's looking for a job and is a, quite a talented person, was a bank manager in, her, in Ukraine and um, uh, has lots of skills to offer. Uh, both speak enough English to get by, to communicate. Um, and so if any of you have space in your home and would be interested in opening it up to this uh, young mother and 11-year-old daughter, uh, please give the church office a call. We also have another longtime friend of the congregation who is also looking for a room to rent or an ADU um, housing of some sort. So those of you who have extra space, please pray about that this week and see if you might be interested um, in making your house available, even if it's just for a limited amount of time. The friend of the congregation is, uh, is a, I'm going to guess, 50-something-year-old man. Um, and uh, so just so you know gender and what you're thinking about and praying about so please let me know if you have any uh, interest in trying that out even for a brief amount of time okay all right now go in peace share the good harvest of God's love everywhere you go Thank you, God.